We find no shortage of inspiration, sometimes from unexpected sources, to describe just how challenging the last year has been. Ben Folds, a musician in a fitting lyric, asked between 1918, 1930, and 1968 to one, and ultimately came to the conclusion that we're not repeating history necessarily, just the parts of history that sucked. A devastating global pandemic, which has inflicted over 27 million infections in America and killed over 480,000, including over 45,000 men and women in the state of New York. A resulting economic crisis with growth at its lowest point since World War II. A prolonged period of civil unrest in America that brought to the forefront issues of race relations in the United States today. And finally, a period of political tension and unprecedented division and disinformation made manifest by a deadly destructive riot at the US Capitol. This multitude of maladies has created an unprecedented threat environment to live in every day. Intelligence analysis aimed at understanding and ideally mitigating threats of mass casualty violence and acts of terrorism. Pandemic, recession, unrest, polarization. While each of these separate crises are distinct in so many unique ways, they're united by one fact, their continuous exploitation by extremists across a wide range of ideologies, from foreign terrorist groups to domestic extremists. Our careers in the Homeland Security field are a stitch work of significant moments, successes and failures, triumphs and tragedies. Seldom do certain dates stand out, stitched into memory with lessons learned. For me, one such date is shown here, October 23rd, 2014. Some folks on the chat may remember it well. It was an occasion from nearly seven years ago, but it still feels like one of my worst days in the NYPD. On that rainy Thursday, an individual shown here named Zale Thompson, armed with a hatchet, carried out an assault in Queens. The assailant was a blended ideology extremist and held a whole hodgepodge of views, ranging from racially motivated extremism and anti-law enforcement sensitive information, but law enforcement sensitive uh, sentiment to Salafi jihadist extremism. While these images show the attacker before the assault that took place, I wanna move on to this next photograph. The perpetrator's target here wasn't an iconic location. It wasn't a piece of infrastructure or a symbolic landmark. It was something far more critical, a group of four NYPD officers. Two of them shown here, officers Meeker and Healy, were critically injured in the assault. Both survived and thankfully were able to recover. But as an intel analyst, this incident struck me deeply. For many of us in the field, we absorb a lot of extremist content and sure that comes with a certain degree of mental harm, but we're fortunate to do our work from a position of relative safety. Our brothers and sisters in uniform don't come with the same type of risk necessarily. They involve themselves in the field with a certain degree of anonymity and have a much greater risk level when they're out in the streets. On this day, these four individuals were targeted for nothing more than the badges on their chest and the uniforms they wore and the authority that they represented. So why is this attack from seven years ago still relevant today? Because at the time it demonstrated many of the challenges which have only become highly exacerbated and accelerated over the last year. Namely, the danger of lone individuals and small groups who continue to receive an abundance of propaganda from across the ideological spectrum. Violent propaganda often from different and opposing ideologies. Roughly a month before the attack that took place, the now deceased ISIS spokesperson Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, who many of you may remember, released a propaganda message that called for attacks on Westerners specifically encouraging low-tech attacks on police, on security personnel, and on intelligence members. NYPD analysts briefed this threat largely to mostly our counterterrorism personnel and private sector stakeholders. But I've asked myself personally over the years if more could have been done on my end to get it out to more than 35,000 members of service. While we're not certain that the assailant ever watched this specific video, its content continues years after the spokesperson's death, and it lives on in newer, flashier, short form, meme-like propaganda that's aimed over the course of this year at an increasingly vulnerable audience. In the current moment, the unprecedented level of multifaceted crises that we face, it's important to bear in mind that this type of open source intelligence and extremist propaganda content is not just diagnostic, not just something we do after the fact in an after action report and an assessment, but it can also be highly diagnostic and prognostic as well giving us an opportunity to gauge the threat environment, to look at the surrounding area, and hopefully anticipate an act of violence. There have been at least 31 attacks, unfortunately inspired or enabled by foreign terrorist groups, as many of you know, since 2014. The most recent five occurring in Arizona, Florida, Texas, and most recently in New York City, amid our COVID-19 spike and a period of civil unrest this past summer. 
All of these incidents of the last uh, five that were mentioned have uniquely targeted law enforcement or military personnel, demonstrating that public service sectors writ large are often viewed as valuable and justifiable targets. Now, the targeting of law enforcement officers, however, is not limited to the propaganda of foreign terrorist groups, not by a long shot, like groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. These groups do not have a monopoly over the market of anti-government violence. And over the last year, the NYPD has observed both far-left anarchist violent extremists and anti-authoritarian individuals, but also Salafi jihadist groups and far-right racially, ethnically, and motivated violent extremists encouraging attacks against law enforcement. It's a convergent theme that has echoed throughout the years, but has likely increased, especially after the mass arrests and ongoing law enforcement investigations in the aftermath of the Capitol riot, something which should be of concern for all of us. Now, as you can see from this slide, a lot has changed in the extremist propaganda world since the hatched attack, developments that have likely intensified and accelerated over the last year. For one, extremist propaganda remains abundant. And while several private sector companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram have gone to great lengths at removing increasingly insightful content that may have extremist propaganda, threatening images, and overall content that incites violence, these actions have also led to an opportunistic reaction, the repurposing of some of the more secure platforms mentioned in one of the earlier talks on areas like Gab, Viber, Threema, Signal, 4chan, 8kun, often platforms that are more insular and also less responsive to legal process. But also, extremist propaganda is frankly much easier to produce now than ever before. It's driven by younger digital natives with an ease of access to simple photo editing and visual design software tools no further than the reach of their phone. Largely gone are the Don Draper days of Mad Men style propaganda firms pushing out propaganda product at length. Now, while some of those do persist, what we're mostly seeing are graphics like that are shown on this screen. Memes, stylized propaganda, often taken from violent video games or in some cases from cinematic visions of dystopian worlds and film and screen. But it's not just the content and the construction of the content that has changed over time. It's also the customer. And that's perhaps the most important aspect of this talk. For nearly a year, a population increasingly isolated and often screen locked by necessity due to COVID-19 has likely become much more vulnerable and susceptible to disinformation and the subtle creep of meme-like propaganda like this. This extremist messaging is more unique than ever before, and it's aimed at exploiting the current wave of pandemic-associated frustration. It's often separation-related depression, economic anxiety, personal political grievances, and any number of other factors that can often play a role in an individual's unique mobilization to violence. Now, I know that there is a temptation with this abundant fire hose of propaganda to often dismiss a lot of it as aspirational chatter, but I cannot stress enough that just because it is open source intelligence or OSINT does not mean that it is irrelevant. And with investigative effort, critical signal can and will be found amid the noise, not just by law enforcement agencies or the intelligence community, but by every facet of the Homeland Security enterprise. A clear example of this comes from November of 2019, before the pandemic, when an individual named Zachary Clark, recently pleaded guilty to material support for terrorism charges, was arrested in Brooklyn. This individual shared widely more destructive propaganda, but also some of the images that are shown on this screen. Now, these multi-pronged crises that we face have likely created, as I mentioned, more vulnerable individuals to extremist propaganda. But how exactly have key groups exploited some of these unique issues and crises? Since the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis and the severe toll that it's inflicted on the US, Salafi jihadist extremists have wasted no time in exploiting the pandemic readily in propaganda. Groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda often reached out to their supporters with subtle variations on this type of theme. They drove out-group narratives, praising how militant factions like Al-Shabaab and Somalia have provided care for individuals during the COVID-19 outbreak. They've weakened faith in government and often described the virus as a form of divine retaliation, calling for retribution against the US. These groups have also uniquely called for opportunistic attacks that took the same low-tech tactics, which were mentioned in years and years of propaganda releases, but now frame them in an opportunistic light, saying that amid COVID-19, law enforcement resources are stretched and it might be an opportune time for an attack. Also exploiting mandatory public health measures like masking in some cases to maintain that individuals should conduct assaults with a greater degree of anonymity. Now, not to be outdone though, on the right side of the screen, you'll see that domestic extremists have taken similar measures to maintain relevance through the topical issue of coronavirus. This end of the extremist spectrum has mostly aimed to spread disinformation, 
while encouraging supporters to turn the pathogen into a form of bioweapon through deliberate infectious contact with goods, infrastructure, and individual outgroups, often using anti-Semitic lines or targeting racial or religious groups that they're opposed to. Pandemic lockdown measures and other public health efforts have also been used to drive extremist conspiracies, often against the technology sector, and government control has been at the primary bedrock of disrupted plots, attacks, and violence that some of you may have encountered over the course of the last year. This next slide will show another form of this disturbing and opportunistic trend. The tragic police-involved killing of George Floyd in May of last year brought law enforcement and race relations to the forefront of the national conversation amid a period of sustained civil unrest nationwide in many major cities and communities across the US. But here again, sensing a moment to maintain relevance, as this is what many of these groups seek to do, and an opportunity to seize upon domestic political tension, foreign terrorist organizations and domestic extremists did what they've done in some cases for years, despite distinct ideologies attempting to act opportunistically, encouraging individuals to take advantage of the situation. Salafi jihadist extremists move quickly to leverage nationwide protests and civil unrest and propaganda. Mostly these groups used a series of high profile police involved shootings over the last year to draw false equivalencies regarding racial inequality in the US while also driving at perceived injustices carried out by the US military abroad. Themes of targeted grievance and also of shared oppression were often exploited when wedded to calls for legitimate and justified retaliation in their view against authoritative figures. Also the images of the protests themselves roundly circulated in propaganda with the idea of portraying America in a state of perpetual chaos. And just like COVID-19, foreign terrorist organizations regularly encouraged opportunistic attacks by lone offenders. Racially and ethnically motivated extremist propaganda was a bit more direct on this issue. Known violent extremist groups like the National Socialist Order on the Neo-Nazi end and the more anarchist Boogaloo movement, adherents often discussed carrying out assaults on protests themselves and law enforcement with the idea of perpetuating violence and ultimately generating larger clashes. High profile incidents where demonstrators were shot in places like Kenosha, Wisconsin or in Portland, Oregon, became not just isolated incidents of violence unto themselves, but also opportunistic opportunities for propaganda, turning alleged shooters into actual individuals that could be praised, martyred or lionized, and also using incidents of violence at protest themselves as opportunistic models to follow. You'll see that high profile incidents just as recently as the last few weeks have been also praised as models to follow used in extremist meme like propaganda that as mentioned in an earlier talk doesn't often get noticed, but can still resonate with individuals who are increasingly primed for violence. Now I know that this presentation so far has been a bit morbidly depressing and isn't left with much of optimism, which tends to be the nature of analysts, but I want to end on an uplifting note. I started with October 23rd, 2014 as one of the worst days on my job. I wanna end with an image of one of our best. On a regular basis in a post 9-11 world, NYPD analysts are encouraged to work closely with their brothers and sisters in uniform. Brothers and sisters, our coworkers, our friends, and our family. Amid this crisis environment, it's more important than ever before to be briefing your individuals, regardless of whether or not they're in law enforcement agency, on the social media open source threats that they may face, primarily for situational awareness. But the current issue of the exploitative environment that we see now, with many crises and extremist propaganda exploiting it on a regular basis, it's important for us to all take a look at our own agencies. And that's what I'd encourage partners at Apex to do. Look within your agency today regardless of whether or not you're a law enforcement entity, if you're a Homeland Security office, if you're an emergency planning outlet, if you're a fire department, if you're a police department of 15 or 15,000 members of service, engage whether or not the current tools that you have, the amount of access and resource and the, and the degree of seriousness that you treat extremist propaganda can be leveraged more effectively to reach a wider audience of your people. And then imagine looking at your hand, what you could do with five additional months of preparation. Perhaps that's the amount of time needed to make strategic personnel changes or strategic policy shifts in your agency to meet a growing threat. With five weeks of coordination, perhaps that's the amount of time needed to reach out to another law enforcement partner, to another Homeland Security agency and prepare a tabletop exercise across fields with the goal of securing a high profile event. With five days of planning, the amount of time needed to harden a secure perimeter when there's anticipated information indicating a possible high profile attack. 
with five minutes of warning, the amount of time that you may need to move personnel in the midst of a high profile violent mass gathering that has the potential to lead to even greater clashes. And then most importantly, with five seconds of pause, five seconds. That's the amount of time that an officer on patrol, that a firefighter outside of a station may have to look around their surroundings to gauge the overall threat environment, make sense of it, and anticipate a potentially dangerous and deadly assault with an edged weapon. That five seconds is the single most important end state goal of intelligence analysts today. And that's something worth striving for. It's been a real honor to come back virtually to NPS. I wanna thank you all for your time and for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. So there was one incident going back to March of last year. Uh, in particular, it was a, a piece of propaganda, you could call it that based on the context alone, but not necessarily by the gra graphic. The graphic was a general awareness chemical guidance bulletin given out by you know, law enforcement and public safety agencies alike. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, at the very beginning, you remember we were all you know, running outside of our houses to grab Clorox wipes and looking to find the most readily available chemical solvents to clean our homes. Uh, this guidance was given out saying, these are certain chemicals that you shouldn't mix, ammonia, Clorox, et cetera. But extremists seized upon this. They put it out in a different context, saying, oh, look at all these potentially attractive ways that an individual can make noxious chemicals, use them in an attack, ultimately generate individuals having reactive symptoms that they might confuse with COVID-19. Uh, so in this case, you know, it requires a certain moment of pause of not only being aware of that information and observing it, letting your call dispatchers know that this is something that is out there that they should be mindful of, but also perhaps giving us a few moments of reflection when we push out large amounts of content like this, that our audience isn't always the audience of individuals that we intend these products to go out to. So for the most part, you know, the mass movement that we've seen, not just over the last few weeks, but going back to the last few months of highlighting certain key topics of concern when they often are associated with uh, you know, violent conspiracy theories or things that may involve individuals mobilizing more faster to violent plots and attacks. Uh, individuals have been deplatformed, moved off from some of the more mainstream networks like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And ultimately what they've wound up doing is pivoting themselves, moving to more secure uh, channels as mentioned before, places like Rocket Chat, Prima, Parler, which just recently came back online. Uh, if you saw some of the open source media reports just in the last few days. The challenge here is that it becomes increasingly more difficult to identify these individuals based on the content that they're posting. It requires a different degree of access in many cases uh, for some of these communications channels. And so while the net positive is that you possibly wind up cleaning down the recruitment of mass images of it resonating with the largest number of people, the individuals who do access it are like the persons who are more committed to violence themselves and operating in a more secure environment. We've also seen domestic extremist groups in particular take advantage of the deplatforming that took place in the last few weeks. Individuals have posted you know, openly that this is a prime opportunity with individuals who are platform refugees, if you will, moving from one large area of, of considered threat to another um, and trying to get them into their more extreme channels, mostly through subtle recruitment and pivoting. Uh, so it's a challenge that we're gonna face. You know, it re requires, I think, a, a longer form policy judgment on when this is appropriate, when it is effective and when it's counterproductive, but that doesn't mean outright that deplatforming itself is a tool that should go away. I think that particularly as the uh, election uh, lead up took place, we saw just an unprecedented level and rightly so of interagency coordination when it came to a whole range of different threats. With propaganda, it's, it's a little bit difficult because you can have an entity releasing the propaganda who is not the individual they say they are. And in particular, you know, one thing to kind of bear in mind is as you're assessing and analyzing propaganda, the investigative side that's more focused on where it originated from. The operational side is who is the intended recipient. And I think that there's this temptation that we can't do both of those things at the same time, but we absolutely can. So working with agency partners that have the ability perhaps to identify when something is misinformation is strategically valuable and maybe valuable for an investigation, but seeing the content itself, whether or not it's an agency uh, in a foreign hostile you know, adversarial state aimed at you know, individuals in the US uh, gathered at a mass gathering, individuals that are part of a, a fringe extremist group. Um, we're more concerned and need to be concerned about the individuals that are on the receiving end. 
regardless of whether or not it's disinformation or genuine uh, actionable information. I'd say 100%, you know, I gave one example of, of a case regarding an individual who was posting this content that's recently been adjudicated. But across the board, you know, it's difficult to gauge uh, when your actions have been successful when you're looking at a broad stream of propaganda. Um, ultimately, I, you can't prove a negative. That's obviously one, uh, you know, reality of circumstances, but that shouldn't be just a sole defense. Uh, the purpose and the value of this, if not explicit in a propaganda-related arrest, is often just to make sure that you have individuals staging at locations where they are appropriate, bolstering their protection based on a particular threat that you see, or a reaction to a high-profile catalytic event. And on that circumstance, I think we've been you know, tremendously successful. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the intelligence that we produce is getting out actionable threat information to other partners through some of our nationwide uh, law enforcement information networks. That was particularly important to us in working with our partners in the lead up to the inauguration. It was something that took place that had an out of area implication. But for the most part in New York, sometimes identifying a propaganda value uh, piece means putting additional resources where they're needed in the short term and then making an intelligence-based assessment on whether or not that propaganda in the long run has the staying power to incite violence. Absolutely. Um, I know I can give you a, a reference uh, personally, the NYPD Shield Initiative, which has been you know, existing for several years. It's primarily a private sector partnership. That's in addition to the massive efforts nationwide that DHS puts out with its office of the private sector. You know, these uh, products that are produced and released to private sector stakeholders often provide a lens into some of the propaganda, you know, and the extremist content and threats that we regularly monitor and observe, um, especially when agencies may not have necessarily the personnel that are uniquely assigned to do that type of work. Um, and we've also put out previously uh, products that involve threats to medical facilities specifically. Um, and I want to kind of put spin this in a slightly different light. You mentioned uh, in the question about the overall process for the vaccine, individuals who are deploying it. As we look at extremist content that fuels conspiracy narratives, particularly individuals who are suspicious of the vaccine, uh, who maintain that there is some uh, violent or nefarious government element to the vaccination itself, you know, that's something that may not necessarily indicate a specific threat against your facility, but it is something that's worth raising to your security guard who's deployed for eight hours you know, at that location. Um, these are the minor things that may say, you know, we know that this is a threat that you're mindful of, Here's the reason why for the foreseeable and you know, the near-term future, you should be you know, slightly more vigilant. And I know we hear that all the time. Uh, there's news reports consistently that say, you know, increased vigilance is urged and increased situational awareness has been called for and security has been stepped up. And it makes the public often wonder, oh, you know, why is security not perpetually in this state? And I think for intelligence personnel, for briefers, for anyone who has people that they're responsible for caring for or securing, it's about ensuring that there's muscle memory and that that muscle memory can be relied upon in key moments where you suspect an elevated concern or an elevated threat. And that's something that we can all do if we have daily rollout briefings, if we have team calls on Zoom. Uh, it's a small portion of daily responsibilities, but it's an important one and one that I think we all have a role in. I think that you're going to see uh, an uptick in terms of the meme-like propaganda that was mentioned on one of the earlier presentations where it's deliberately designed in some you know, way or capacity to defeat some of the monitoring systems that have been uh, you know, increased over the course of the last few years. Uh, so the idea of embedded text, in place text, graphics that wind up appearing, disappearing more frequently on platforms is one way to potentially get around that that I think extremists will exploit. I think we'll still continue to see legacy propaganda from organizations like ISIS and Al Qaeda, uh, you know, influx on magazines and that sort of thing. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with Inspire and Rumia from years past. But one trend to also be mindful of is propaganda that more specifically in short form weds tactical guidance. You know, it used to be that you would have propaganda that was more like an encyclopedic uh, recipe book or a diatribe on why individuals should you know, be cooking for one reason or another. The next type of propaganda is more like a flashing eat at Joe's sign, where you see constant information being bombarded on a more regular basis, often on more narrow and more difficult to identify platforms and also attaining individuals of a certain degree of experience where once a platform is removed, they can move rapidly to develop new, more secure, and even disposable messaging systems. I think that's a problem that's here to stay.